Part 2. But the next morning, Mr. and Mrs. Shiny Shoes had already gone to work by the time Claude woke up. He looked around for Sir Bobbly Sock, who often helped him put on his beret. He would do this very importantly, as it was a very important job. That morning, however, Sir Bobbly Sock did not do his job very importantly. In fact, he didn't do it at all. He just lay in bed like a sad, sick sock. Claude looked at him very closely and frowned. Sir Bobbly Sock did have the habit of sometimes pretending to be poorly. He would lie there all cross-eyed and floppy, waiting for Claude to find him and make a big fuss. Hmm, said Claude, and he poked Sir Bobbly Sock in the tummy. Hmm, he said again, and he prodded Sir Bobbly Sock's baubles. Hmm, he said for the third time, and he took Sir Bobbly's temperature with a banana. Claude thought for a minute. Sir Bobbly Sock, he said, you are not very well. All that shopping and rushing around in the city has worn you out. I think I will have to take you to the hospital. So he did. Claude didn't know where to find an ambulance, so instead he decided to make his own. He tucked Sir Bobbly Sock safely under his arm and put on his roller skates. Flashing his torch above his head, shouting, Woo! For the siren, he skated to the hospital with Sir Bobbly Sock. They arrived in no time at all. The hospital was a tall white building which smelt of medicine and sticky plasters. Claude had only ever seen pictures of hospitals in books before. He thought that a real one was much better because it wasn't flat and drawn on paper. Claude popped Sir Bobbly Sock in a wheelchair. They joined the end of a long queue of people, all waiting to see the doctor. Claude didn't mind waiting because he had a tail to wag, but Sir Bobbly Sock grumbled until Claude got him a cup of milk and a biscuit to dunk. Eventually, it was time for Sir Bobbly Sock to see the doctor. He was a tall, thin man with a tidy mustache and something dangling around his neck. I am Dr. Ivan Akinbum, he said. What seems to be the problem? Sir Bobbly Sock suddenly came over all shy, so Claude explained. I see, said Dr. Akinbum. Well, we will soon get you feeling better again. Now, let me have a look at you. Claude watched closely as Dr. Akinbum prodded and poked Sir Bobbly Sock's tummy, listened to his heart with the dangly thing, and took Sir Bobbly Sock's temperature, this time with a thermometer, not a banana. Claude sniffed haughtily. He always found bananas were much better for taking temperatures. Dr. Ackenbaum wrinkled his brow and looked at Claude. I need to take your friend for an x-ray so we can see what's going on inside him. You stay here and we will be back soon. And he wheeled Sir Bobbly Sock out of the room in his wheelchair. Claude was now alone in the room. At first, he sat very still. Then his eyes started to wander. Then his paws. And then his body. He started to look through all the drawers and cupboards. There were bandages and sticky plasters and safety pins and lots of other exciting things besides. Last of all, he opened a tall cupboard and gasped. He gasped like this. <gasps> there, hanging all alone, was a white coat, exactly like the ones Dr. Akenbaum and the other doctors were wearing. Claude reached in, took the coat off the hanger, and put it on. I look just like a doctor, he said, and he twirled around to see himself from every side. Just then, the door burst open and a tall nurse rushed in, looking red-faced and bothered. Oh, doctor, she cried. Thank goodness I found you. Claude looked around to find the doctor she was talking to, but there was no one else in the room. She was talking to him. There's an emergency, the nurse said, and with a deep breath, she told him all about it. Apparently, a group of wrestlers had come into the hospital, all complaining of a mystery illness, and now everyone in the waiting room had caught it. 
The nurse said that Claude was the only doctor she could find. He would have to find out what this mystery illness was. Before Claude could explain that he wasn't a real doctor, he was just Claude, the enormous nurse had hauled him into the waiting room. Well, everyone was in a terrible state. The wrestlers were groaning in the corner. A large man covered in tattoos had dropped his embroidery and was fainting by the pot plant. And some acrobats from the circus that had come to town were laying over the front desk. Claude had no idea what to do. He tried to remember when he had been poorly. There was the time he had been to an all-you-can-eat restaurant and had eaten everything, including his table. He had been sick the next morning. Maybe these people in the waiting room had done the same. But nobody smelt of noodles or plywood, so that wasn't the problem. Claude scratched his head. Once, he had tried to knit a deck chair and ended up tying himself in knots, so he'd fallen over and bumped his head. He took a quick look around the waiting room. No one had any knitting needles, and nobody's head was bright red and bumpy. No, that wasn't the problem. Claude sighed. There was only one thing for it. He rummaged around in his beret until he found emergency banana. He then started to take people's temperatures with it. But by the time he'd finished, he still didn't know what the problem was. Nobody was too hot and nobody was too cold. Claude was just wondering if he should start prodding people when there came a noise from behind the desk. It was the clock striking 11 o'clock in the morning. Suddenly, Claude felt himself starting to wobble. He felt like he was about to faint. And it was exactly then that he realized what the mystery illness was. Nurse, he cried, I've solved the problem. These people have got 11 o'clock-itis. What they need is a nice cup of tea and a sit-down. And possibly a biscuit, if you have any. The nurse beamed a big smile, spun around, Claude ducked, and clattered off to the kitchen. She came back carrying a huge tray, piled high with cups and biscuits and a gigantic teapot. Claude helped her dish out the drinks and biscuits to the people in the waiting room. As soon as they had dunked their biscuits and had a slurp of tea, they started to come around. It wasn't very long before the wrestlers had each other in headlocks. The acrobats were swinging from light fittings, and the man with the tattoos was busily fixing his cross-stitch. In the distance, Claude could hear Dr. Ackenbum talking to Sir Bobbly Sock, so he ran back to the office. Claude took off the doctor's coat and hung it up in the cupboard. Then he quickly combed his ears with a clipboard and sat down neatly in the chair. Seconds later, Dr. Ackenbum arrived, wheeling Sir Bobbly Sock, who, Claude thought, looked a lot better. He's all better, said Dr. Ackenbum to Claude. We've solved the problem. He had a small hole in the heel, so we've had our best surgeon darn it, and now he's as good as new. Claude was going to ask if Sir Bobbly Sock had behaved himself, but then he noticed that his friend was wearing a large sticker which said, I was darn good in the hospital, so he didn't bother. You are free to go home now, said Dr. Ackenbum. So Claude said, thank you, and goodbye, and set off with Sir Bobbly Sock, but they didn't go by ambulance. The wrestlers were so grateful to Claude for curing them of mystery illness that they carried him and Sir Bobbly Sock all the way home. Claude and Sir Bobbly Sock decided this was a very good way to travel. Only, perhaps not every day.